Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and Powers of Ten, issue number five of six. We've got two more issues to go. One power, one house. The whole house is coming down. Let's get started on who made this book. Let's talk about the book itself. We got Jonathan Hickman doing the writing, uh, R.B. Silva doing the art, Marty Gracia doing the colors, Silva and Gracia do the cover, also the main cover, uh, VCs Clayton Cowles on the letters, and Tom Mueller doing the design. And a whole bunch of people doing the variant covers, and uh, X-Men were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. This issue is called For the Children. Professor X states, and this is throughout the book until the end where it gets buck uh, they will think we are doing one thing, but the truth is we are doing something altogether different. I ain't no lie. <laughs> I ain't no lie. We start off with this first page. Just look at this gorgeous art. Mwah! How you doing, baby? How you doing? We're basically... Um, Professor X is saying, hey man, can you upgrade Cerebra for me? You know, I created the first one, but it was really basic. And then Hank McCoy made all the other ones, and I need you to make version 7. The badass ultimate one. And he's like, yeah, I think I could do that. But it's going to cost money. He's like, pretend money is not a matter. He's like, so I can get asked for a fusion reactor and you're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, we good. Um, yeah, man, the, uh, what is it here, the, the smile? <laughs> On Professor X's face, after you know, after he's saying like, "This is all I want to do." Look at once uh, Forge realizes he's allowed to do whatever he wants with this thing. Wow! So we're gonna find out about um, like here's the the very first of the the pages that just gives us the the details. We're gonna learn all about version seven of Cerebro and its functionality. Once a week, Professor Xavier copies the latest version of Mutant Kind. So. You know, this week I do you, you know, I, I just take all your stuff. Next week, I just go from week to week. It takes about three hours to do this. Now, here's the question. Is it three hours per mutant or three hours in total? Because we're talking about a lot of mutants here. We're talking about a lot of mutants. Because it gets worse. It also says, you know, every year we saw this. He does a hard backup, meaning he says, forget all that week to week stuff. I'm going back to the beginning. I'm getting all their memories from here to here. All right? From, from the beginning to now. I want all those memories. Hard backup. There's going to be uh, a total of five different um, uh, backups. Okay? Three of them just redundancy. Uh, another one as the main. Another one as a main, main, secret, hidden, you know, double secret formation <laughs> kind of uh, backup. On top of that, we find out that the cradle... That's where the uh, the mines are actually put back in. You know, um, as a survivalist, I often say uh, it's something I learned in the military too. Two is one, one is none. So always have two of everything on you. If you carry one knife on you, oh, that's great. That's that's great. What if you lose that one? But if you have two on you, you can lose one. Don't lose one. But if you did, you've still got one. That's important. It's important to always keep in mind. Professor X is like, no, 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 I'm going to have five. And he's smart because he doesn't keep them all in one place. Literally. Different worlds sometimes. That's awesome. We also get a little bit more on Moira's no place. After this, we're going to Paris, to the Louvre. That's how we pronounce it in America. What is it? The um, um, Musée de Louvre uh, in, uh, in French? Anyway, um... This is the, the Winged Victory, probably one of the most famous freaking sculptures on the face of the planet. And um, what do you call it? That's where, I mean, where else? That's where um, Wonder Woman is. Oh, wait, no, Emma Frost. This is a Marvel comic. There's a movie quote. Oh, forget it. Anyway, so this is 10 years in the future. So Professor X is walking. He's got his portable Cerebro, which defies gravity because he got a hell of a backbone. So um, it's not just him there, though. It's Magneto also. Magneto all dressed in white. It's like, hey, what's up, baby? And she's all dressed in white. Hey, baby. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Magneto, in this book, when he's talking to her, sounds more like the, the movie version of Magneto than ever before. And I'm not talking about the newer ones. I'm talking about the original X-Men movies. Um, I know his name. I know his name. It's just not coming to me right now. But anyway, um, not Fassbender, the original one. The guy who also played, um, he played Gandalf, right? Yeah, uh, him. Anyway, um, famous actor. I know his name. 
But anyway, you get the gist. So it's a really good conversation, as you can tell. Basically, she has taken over the Hellfire Club. Now, this is important because we know that one of the stories coming out soon, there's going to be like, what, five or so um, books stemming from this main book. Once this book ends, there's going to be like five or so other versions of X-Men books coming out. One of them is called The Marauders, which is basically the Hellfire Club. Why isn't it called the, the Hellfire Club? Why is it instead called The Marauders? We might have a good understanding of that here. The Hellfire Club is a great entity, and Professor X and Magneto need her to be in charge of the Hellfire Club. In fact, they're going to be making a uh, secret inner circle, okay? Not for the Hellfire Club, but for all the mutantdom, okay? The secret circle. And it's going to have 12 seats on it. Professor X and Magneto, of course, have two of those seats. They're offering her one of those seats. We don't find out all of the seats on here. In fact, besides those three, we only find one more seat. And that is... Um, well, I'll tell you that in a second. The idea here is that they need her to use the Hellfire Club to get the drugs out as a sole distributor. And they're going to give her a 20, A, hey, as uh, uh, Emma Frost, I am a, a, a businesswoman and I am not going to sit with a, a basic offer. I'm going to negotiate my ass off. And she negotiates so well that Magneto kind of stumbles over his words and says, 20 year, I, I meant 50 year. She's like, that's more like it. So a 50 year solo deal. Um, economics isn't my uh, one of my specialties, but finances, namely business finance and business law, is. So this was cool that I got to understand everything that was happening here. They need her to distribute, as the Hellfire Club, the drugs all throughout. Now, we remember that one issue where we were talking about uh, all the places that are greenlit to take the drugs. More specifically, we were focusing on the few that were not going to take the drugs through one reason or another. And was wondering, we're wondering ourselves, why aren't they going to get these drugs? What's going to happen? If they're not going to recognize the sovereignty of Krakoa and the mutants, therefore we got a problem. They're probably also not going to let their mutants go, if that's the case. So what are they going to do? Well, she's going to take care of the distribution of the drugs, but only to the main places that accept it. She's going to, uh, we're going to need somebody else inside the Hellfire Club who can uh, distribute the, to the, the, the underground, all right? So the black market, so to speak. They need somebody special for that. And that is the Black King, Sebastian Shaw. She just got rid of him, she says. Well, they need uh, him back in. So they're, that's why they're willing to offer her two seats on the board. So we've got those four seats right there. Two seats, one for Magneto, one for Professor X, one for Emma, one for Sebastian. She says, I'm going to need three seats, though. So now we're going to divide the seats into seasons. So... Three of the seasons, and we they actually show it in here. Um, oh, wow, get off, you stupid sticker. Don't mess up my book. How dare you? Um, we're going to go right back here to the... This Venom Island thing is what the frick. <laughs> it's not part of this book. It's just a, um, uh, an advertisement, but wow. So these are the seats. This is how it's going to work. This is the circle in and of itself, basically the Knights of the Round Table. Look at that, nine of them, right? Or, excuse me, 12 of them, just, you know, now it's nine. Anyway, so we know uh, four of them, right? Uh, Krakoa and Cypher are going to be outside of the circle. I guess that they're going to be kind of like the vice president uh, when it comes to Congress. If there's a complete divide and they can't break a vote, then there's these two to break the tie. Um I don't know what's going to happen if they both decide on something different, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, that's what it's going to be. So there are 14 chairs, but only 12 of them are on the inner circle. What exactly is it? The quiet council. So, um, yeah, they're divided. So autumn, winter, spring, summer. I don't think that it's going to be a rotating who's going to be in charge during each season. I think it's just that's where they're going to call them all. But the Hellfire Club is the winter. Uh, no, excuse me, the spring. Hellfire Club is considered the spring one. So there are three seats for the Hellfire Club. We don't know who that third seat is going to yet. We don't know who is going to get the seat with here. 
is it going to be sinister? Might actually wind up being uh, um, apocalypse. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, um, wicked, <laughs> very wicked. Oh crap! It might be Moira. That would make sense. Anyway, enough with the speculation. So they need to distribute these drugs to people. Which drugs? Of course, we're talking about the uh, three drugs that are going to go out into the human world. So now we understand the economic ramifications of these drugs. The whole purpose for them doing these drugs is so that they can, of course, gain the, um, uh, the independence and say, listen, now we got this trade going. We already established that. But they also talk about the uh, patent for this. They're talking about a permanent monopoly. Now, I don't know how realistic that is. We'll have to see. Okay, we'll have to see. And I've got speculation for both. I'm going to go over that right now. Um, in the drug company, a uh, very special thing going on. We don't like monopolies in America, right? Here's the problem. We still allow them. We still allow them. Why? Uh, for the drug companies, very specifically, you can have a seven-year monopoly on a drug. Um, this is your reward for discovering something. So if you're going after a particular drug and we're, you know, we're going to use the most famous case that all, uh, doctors always use in this particular case, uh, all drug researchers, we're going to use Viagra. <sighs> Viagra was like that magical, holy crap. They made billions off of this other drugs. They don't make a whole lot. For the sake of conversations, vaccinations, you make almost nothing. You make next to nothing on that. Viagra, however, that's something where you're taking all the time. They, you know, I think they say like up to four per month or something like that. I'm not at that stage where I need them yet. But I know about this case because I studied this in high, or high school, in uh, college. So you have um, these people looking for, uh, I forget what the company is that makes, was it Pfizer, I think it is, that makes... Um, um, Viagra. So they say, check this out. We're studying to try and find out a way to, to make this, um, uh, drug that we were trying to do this. I forget what they were originally trying to do with it. And they wound up, you know, realizing, Hey, this is basically a horny pill. It makes old men horny or people who can't get up horny people who have major back issues. They get horny, they get wood. All right. Let's just call it what it is. All right. Uh, so they started trying to put it together and, and put everything in the right places so they can get a patent on it. Now, other companies, of course, started finding about this stuff also because loose, loose lips sink ships, right? So the, the ships were trying to, you know, poke holes in each other's ships. Um, eventually, they got to the point where this company, Pfizer, I think it was, got the patent first. By them getting the patent first, and it was a, they were approved of the patent, it shut out the other companies that were, they could have been like a minute away. And then all of a sudden, they got the patent. Damn it. Damn it. That means that the company that makes, um, I almost said Prozac, what the hell is it called again? Viagra. They are the only ones allowed to manufacture this drug now for seven years. Seven full years. Uninterrupted. No one else is allowed. This is part of the U.S. not being allowed to negotiate with the drug companies. This is one of those many things they're not allowed to negotiate with. Um, so they have seven-year window where they can only, they're the only ones allowed to do this. They could file to re-up that. Every, I think it's every three or every four years, but it almost never happens. And it didn't happen in the case of Viagra. Now, what does this do? Because in seven years, Cialis, I think, is one of them that came out. I think there's another one that came out. I don't know. And then, of course, you can also have the generics, right? Um, using the main active ingredient and some other minor ingredient. It's the easiest thing in the world. Once once one of them comes out, you take it. It's patent. It's patent. It's done. Oh, you break it down. Oh, hey, I can remanufacture this. This is what anybody can do, right? This is important to these drugs. Um but for seven years, no one else is allowed to get a patent approved. No one else is allowed to sell these. So underground stuff, hey, that's one thing that could count here. Um, the trick is, like, like that's the big reward. You can sell your drug now for seven years with no competition. That's huge. And it showed in the case of Viagra, where... Not only did they make millions by being the only guy in town who had boner medication, but after the seven years where no one else is even allowed to talk about something, then all of a sudden like the Cialis, I think they were doing the race car. They had really cool 
Commercials, right? Viagra didn't even need to do cool commercials. Their name was already established. So they had to start, you know, trying to bring the price down and like, look, we're, we're cheaper and we're just as effective. And we got cooler commercials with the guy with the big smile. Anyway, um, that's how important that seven-year window is. But according to Professor X, he's saying that they can do a permanent monopoly. Why? Because the plant only grows on Krakoa. Now, here's the thing. Can you synthesize something? I was a former, or I am a former electrical engineer. So I have a rudimentary understanding of chemistry. All sciences stem from chemistry. All of them. Um, so, you know, I, I have the basics there. It's my understanding that pretty much anything can be synthesized. Oh, once in a while you'll come across something that can't be. One such thing, in my understanding, is marijuana. It's my understanding that every time that the drug companies try it, because marijuana actually is a cure for a lot of things. I don't use it. I know plenty of people who do. I know plenty of people who are really healthy because of it. Still shouldn't be driving, but whatever. The point is that um, the drug manufacturers have tried many times over to synthesize marijuana, and they can't do it without really bad ramifications, uh, side effects that up to and including death. You know what I'm saying? Um, so can they synthesize this? Well, that depends. That depends. Essentially, you'd figure anything could be synthesized. The question is, once Krakoa has made the plant, can, he, can it continue to alter the plant once it's been plucked? Or, is it, or does he no longer have control over that? Because we've seen him being able to make little body parts that can go other places, right? So, I don't know. I don't know. Can it be synthesized, though? That's the big thing. Um, but if I'm Wakanda, I can assure you I'm trying. And, and I'm, I'm certain that a whole bunch of other companies are going to be trying, too. So that was huge. For me, that was huge. I, I got so invested in that. Then we see Namor. He's basically told, go away. He, he basically tells uh, Professor X, go away. Don't come back to me until you believe what, you know, what, what you're saying that you believe. Everybody else bought it. Namor didn't buy it. That's going to come back. I don't know who that's going to haunt. It's probably going to haunt Professor X. But we're dealing with a whole lot here. And... Then we go into this crazy thing. Now, I'm going to come back to that stuff because a word was said that I feel is very important. But here, we've got the phalanx. This elder, this elder is destroyed. He is fully destroyed in this. Why? Well, the explanation is given when Nimrod, uh, Nimrod, the because this is uh, X3, this is 1,000 years in the future, they uh, were able to contact the phalanx. If we remember, this is a technarch that has, uh, that has bypassed a world mind and, be, and they're trying to become a phalanx. So a technarch up top, skipping the world mind and trying to become a, ph uh, a phalanx directly by being absorbed into the phalanx. They're hoping that this husk, they're going to be like, oh, sure, here you go. You can become a phalanx by yourself. The problem is they didn't realize the things that are beyond those things. And they're explained here. So you've got a titan, a stronghold, and a dominion. Oh, for crying out loud. So a titan... This is what's odd. Um, it's considered a, it's still considered a type zero civilization, which is odd to me. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's like somehow they regress. But anyway, um, yeah, somehow they, um, uh, what do you call it? This, this Titan, this is basically, you remember how I said a type four civilization should be able to utilize everything inside of a universe. That includes a black hole, a supermassive black hole. While it defies what we understand of science, it's that futurism of science, that ability to look into the future and understand that things are going to change radically, including our understanding of these things. 
So the ability to utilize a black hole and turn it into energy, energy that we can actually use, a functional energy, that, that's crazy. But that's what they're trying to do here. Um, within black holes, or the, the purpose of a black hole, is because an entity larger than a phalanx, essentially, a, a civilization that their mind, their brain power is so dense, so filled with eons of, of history and knowledge and accumulated knowledge to boot, it winds up collapsing in on itself and becoming a singularity, becoming a black hole. That's absurd. <laughs> That's crazy. <coughs> but as it turns out, this phalanx that the Technarch has uh, contacted wants to be a Titan. Now, a Titan is one of these civilizations that has this much accumulated knowledge to become uh, the you know, that said Titan. Five Titans or so becomes a, um, uh, what's this one called? A stronghold. And ten or more becomes a Dominion. Although the one that includes the Earth in it is actually about a um, 137, 127, no, uh, 112, 112 Titans. So, this one, this particular phalanx, wants to be a Titan. That's the problem with skipping world mind. Because a world mind probably would have understood that, probably would have recognized this phalanx that they're dealing with, probably would have seen what's beyond the horizon probably would have seen that there's other things like a Titan and more uh, in its future. It's like splitting the atom. We thought an atom is the smallest thing that could possibly exist, and also we split the atom, we see a universe of new information inside, and it's like, oh my god. Wow, Pandora's box. What else is inside these? So, um, there, there is so much more out there. And our stupid technarch didn't understand that. 10,000 years in the future, we're still stupid. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's brilliant. So they realize that by the next day, they're going to be completely consumed. And they're basically like the Borg. Their likeness will be um, uh, assimilated and made into their own. And they're going to become a titan. Now, will this be a lone wolf titan, or will they be absorbed into a larger um, stronghold? Will they be? Um, will they be? Will they war with other titans, or you know, and and try to control them to become their own stronghold? Will they just get absorbed into the dominion that currently exists, which includes this little tiny Earth? Basically, this is like. Think about oh, oh and the only thing that a titan essentially. Uh, wait, what is it here? The note here under. Um, under Dominion is important. Beyond universal abstracts, mind you, a universal abstract is like eternity, infinity, death, um, the living tribunal, you know what I'm saying? Uh, master order, Lord Chaos, all of those. Those are abstracts, okay? Beyond universal abstracts, under which Dominions are seen as naturally occurring, the only primal threat that a Dominion fears are the world eater, Galactus. And the singular, uh, the, yeah, the singular universal manifestation of life, the phoenix. So, as powerful as this dominion is, and mind you, a phalanx is absorbing a technarch, hopefully to become a titan. And when you have ten or more titans, you become a stronghold. The one that the stronghold that is in charge of, excuse me, five or more becomes a stronghold. Ten or more becomes a dominion. And the Dominion that includes Earth has 112 Titans. So, this uh, Dominion is afraid of only two things. Galactus and the Phoenix Force. By that being the last word there, I'm going to bring us back to the pages where they were talking here. Oh, and I happen to go right to the page. What's that word that is mentioned right there? The only word in bold? I think on this entire page. No, Krakoa, two seats, and um, and this word are the only bold-faced ones here. If you can't see it for whatever reason, it says Inferno. Remember we were just talking about X-Men Inferno? Okay, 
So, that sixth life of Moira McTaggart, once that gets unveiled, dude. <laughs> all I'm saying, with all this craziness, you know what I'm most interested in? As Jonathan Hickman keeps going through the Marvel Universe, and he'll pick, like, the Fantastic Four, he'll pick the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., he'll pick uh, the Avengers, the Secret Invaders, the, the, uh, the, the, the Avengers... He'll pick all these different books that, you know, or characters that he's taking over, right? And he's making his own story in the Marvel Universe, the Hickman-verse, if you will. Now he's on the X-Men. Do you remember that one Tony Stark Iron Man review? I think it was the one that I just did recently where I talked about how uh, we really need a sci-fi writer to write Iron Man. Because of all the books that are out there, I mean, what has Iron Man really done lately except for make a new suit of armor? Wow, oh boy, who cares? We need an actual sci science fiction writer to write Iron Man for the book to actually be amazing. Instead of just, oh, this was a cool issue. Screw that. I don't care about a cool issue or a cool, cool arc. I want an amazing title that blows me away. Right now, pretty sure the only person who could do that is Jonathan Hickman. Now, here's the funny thing about it. What's he going to do with his universe once he finally pulls Iron Man into his fold? I'm pretty sure one of these days he's going to say, I want the Iron Man book. And then I can only imagine what's going to happen after that. For now, this is just me being a comic book futurist, right? For now, everything keeps on pointing back to that sixth life, which indicated the Phoenix Five. We saw what happened with um, uh, Namor in here. We know what happened with the Phoenix Five there. We saw what happened with um, uh, Sinister. Like, Sinister didn't even appear in this book, even though he's on here. Why would they even put his picture on here? But they mention Inferno. And then at the very last thing, they mention the, um, um, the Phoenix Force. I'm telling you, that betrayal, where he's going to be on this, it, it seems like it all comes back to Sinister. They're ready for him. Professor X is ready for him. Magneto's ready for him. But what's he going to do that's going to shift everything, the big betrayal? Amazing book, my peeps. Amazing books. This was a long one. Hope you're still awake. Professor Bell, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.